we got all this siding up before lunch. And we'll take a quick walk. I can't believe you don't have anything funny to say, Kenny. I know, it's weird. It is weird. You're such a funny guy. And people look at you. Oh, here's that board that was 62. <laughs> 62 and a quarter? Right. Oh, here. Hold on. It's supposed to be 62 and a quarter. What? Oh, that's the quarter. There's 62 and a quarter. That's funny. Kenny thinks he's funny. <laughs> mm. Take that it back. Was very dumb. Yeah, well, we're pretty dumb. So <laughs> there. Can we continue on with uh, yeah, this property? Yeah, this is a, a professional video. Mm, yeah, yeah. So we're we did all this siding. We got everything caulked. And here in a minute, we're about to spray the paint. This is about to be painted what color? So even the black is going to be what color? Black is going to be black, and the white is going to be white. It's going to be those colors. Oh, we're keeping the black black? I thought you said that these were going to oh, be white. This, this part will be white, but then around the trim and the doors and the windows and stuff, that will be black. Oh, okay. Perfect. So, anyway, that's, that's what we got. And what is and this going to be used for? We're going to use this. Uh, this, okay, so a lot of people don't realize this, but with it being 2020, you have to be prepared. Uh, and so in case there's another pandemic, something that we could not possibly foresee, werewolf hornets, or I don't know, like dolphin sharks. Well, I heard that the new Corona is causing uh, people to start foaming at the mouth and eat people. Correct, so if you have a zombie apocalypse, that's then, the strongest coronavirus out there right now. This it's, is past the Kenny test. You have to eat human beings in order to survive. Yeah. Why don't cannibals eat it. clowns? Because they taste funny. Anyway, that's all I got. Yeah. Oh, hi. <laughs> How you doing? I'm good. So today we uh, we worked on this beautiful little uh, recreational facility. And uh, Kenny and I and John, we, we uh, really kind of, we did a lot. We did the, the siding. We did all the, the uh, what do you call it up there? I don't know, trim. Oh my gosh, the trim up there. <laughs> See, I, I'm not really in construction, but. <laughs> Turns just, out you are. I'm just beginning to yeah. All right, so check realize. this out. I'm gonna put it in layman terms for y'all. Yeah. So yeah. today, John decided to get out his uh, pinstripe uh, spray tip for yep. his, um, for a spray it's rig. like it sprays this wide yeah, it sprays, we, it's it, a lot of different layers it sprays it sprays in pinstripes and also he has the ability to like slow down time um and move it at an unrealistic pace have you ever played prince, prince of persia you like hit the l button yeah. oh. so like whenever he's painting with the pinstripe spray attachment um it looks like like someone's fast forwarding a vhs tape does it have the wavy lines yeah it's got the wavy lines interlace or is that interlace or is yeah, that, yeah yeah okay um anyways i don't talk about video stuff anymore because now i'm just a carpenter um, all right so <laughs> Let's talk to the real man. Okay. Oh, that's me. All right. So what we did here, let me tell you what we did. Yeah. Uh, we put up all the siding. We put up all the trim. We caulked everything. We framed the inside up in that ceiling. And then we painted it. That's pretty much what we did. Not really that much. Just kidding. It was a lot of work. But uh, Kenny is amazing. Dave Canoe is amazing. Our homeowner over here is amazing. I threw my back out today. This is not a drill. I just had to say that because I think it's funny. Daryl laughed too when I said it. Um, okay, so today we uh, had our electrician run some wiring in here. So we wired in all these can lights, which is nice. And we wired in a couple fans up there, which is nice. And then all these outlets. And then we've insulated and then we're about to start sheetrocking. So that's pretty exciting. Daryl, I was just talking to Daryl and he said that he would like to hear about, I had why do bad things happen to good people? And he said he wants to hear why good things happen to bad people. So I'm gonna do both. <clears throat> Number eight, uh, why do you, bad things happen to good people? First of all, we have to set the record straight. Ain't none of us are good people, okay? So when we're all like, why did this happen to me? I'm innocent. You're innocent compared to other people maybe. Like if you compare yourself to Hitler or some bad person, you're like, look at that, I'm great. I'm not like a heroin addict. I'm not a murderer or a child molester. That's nice, but ain't none of us is good people. And I realize that everybody's gonna argue with me about this, but it's true. Uh, the Bible says that God makes the rain to fall down on the good and the evil, and that we're all kind of stuck in the same thing together. And so there's a parable about um, an enemy comes to his enemy's property, and he sows bad seeds in the middle of the night. And so there's this good crop, and then he sows bad seeds in the middle of it. They're called tares, um, kind of weeds or whatever, in the middle of his crop of wheat. And then the work, when, the, when it starts to grow, then the workers come to the owner of the land, and they say, hey, um, there's a bunch of weeds, a bunch of tares, in the middle of all this wheat. Should we try to pull them all out? And he's like, no, because they're all tangled together. And so if you try to tear out the bad ones with the good ones, <clears throat> you'll ruin the good ones too. And so we're gonna let them all grow up together, right next to each other, the good and the evil right next to each other, just mingle together. 
And when the time comes, when the harvest comes, then we'll be able to separate them like the chaff from the wheat, and it'll be just that easy. And so we are stuck, those of us who are good, <laughs> allegedly, <laughs> which I'm gonna, I'm not a good person. Like, I know that some people are like, man, you're a saint, you're an angel. I'm like, compared to Hitler, yes, but compared to Jesus, absolutely not. Nevertheless, those of us that are good, um, we will be separated right out. But we still have to suffer right next to everybody else, and that's just part of life. And, and part of the bad thing about sin is that good people suffer for what bad people do. And that's kind of what makes sin so evil, is the fact that there are good people suffering, innocent people suffering for what bad people do. And does that suck? Yes, that sucks. But also, a lot of the things that we blame God for, we're like, how could you let this and this and this and this happen? I'm sure he looks right back at us and goes, yeah, how do you let all that stuff happen? Because most of the stuff that we complain about is direct consequences from things we were told not to do, and we did it anyway. Anyway, I'm not trying to be a Debbie Downer. So we are going to get some stuff done today. Uh, David Canoe is back hurt this morning, and so I hope his back gets better. I know there are those of you that are sick right now, and uh, I hope that you guys get better too. So I hope you have a wonderful day. Love you guys. Oh, hey there. So um, we got some stuff done today. We got uh, the, the electrician, my electrician, came and did the wiring, which is great. Got all these cam lights put in, which is super fantastic. Um, we insulated the walls that have sheetrock and the ceiling, and then we hung some sheetrock. We also put in doorknobs and things. Uh, and I know that you're thinking to yourself, self, how does John cut this stuff so quickly and so easily? Well, a long time ago, somebody told me, your tape measure doesn't lie. So if you just measure it and then mark it where you measured it, you're good to go. Now that brings up an important point. Like maybe you're doing something and your tape measure is wrong. I saw something recently and this tape measure was like different sizes. Well, that would be very bad. Or what about in your real life, let's say that your moral compass is not pointing north and you think you're doing the right thing, but you're not doing the right thing. Like how do you gauge that? How do you recalibrate that? Um, for example, Daryl told me today that his, uh, he thought he was a certain weight, which was very light. And uh, he kept thinking that he was the same weight <clears throat> for many years. Is that right, Daryl? Yes. And then he went to the doctor and they told him that his weight was much more than what he thought it was. And he was shocked by this. And he goes, no, I swear my, my scale is at this weight. And he went back home and it turns out that his scale maxed out at a certain weight. And he had long, long passed whatever weight that was. And so now he's trying to eat right and exercise or whatever. Anyway, the point is that he realized that his metric for measuring things was incorrect. And now he's taking measures to fix that. And I think that's wonderful. And I think that we need to uh, be teachable because here's the thing. If you are offended by everything and everybody right now is offended by everything, then guess what? You can be easily manipulated. There's a clue. If you're offended by anything, the media or anybody can easily manipulate you. And you're like, they made me mad. Bull crap, you made you mad. Somebody can have the, do the exact same thing to two different people and have two different reactions. They didn't make you do anything. You reacted, you got triggered by something and you allowed this to manipulate you. <clears throat> so don't, because then look, watch. Hey John, you're an idiot. I'm like, that's nice, have a good day. Anyway, that's it. Mm. Uh, hey there. Uh, so, welcome to our day. We've done some sheetrock here this morning and some insulation, and that's nice. Um, I've got a big surprise for everybody. Are you ready for this? I'm having a baby. In China, make my next pair of shoes. Anyway, so um, you can see these circles uh, where the recess lights are. <clears throat> Those can be a challenge, and it occurred to me that maybe you guys don't know how to measure for that. So, there's this drill bit right here. See it? And that just drills and, and cuts the hole, and all you gotta do is find the center. The problem is this drill bit is just a little bit too small, so I have to modify it every time. So rather than use that, because they got me, then what I did is I measured how far it is to the center of this, and then how far it is to the center of this, and I put those measurements up here. And so if we do this, and we go 40 and 3 quarters, this is important, and then we go 41 and 3 eighths this way. What's that, 40? 41 3 is right here. Then that's our center, okay? So how do you make a circle? Good question. We know that that's a six and a half inch diameter, and so the radius is three and a quarter inches. So if we come to the center of this, yep, you got it. Then we go three and a quarter and six and a half. And then we're gonna come this way. Sorry, I'm trying to let you see it. Uh, 
three and a quarter, six and a half, and then same thing here, three and a quarter, six and a half, boom, boom. And then that's your circle, right? So then you just connect the dots. I'm sure you guys have done that. And that's a perfect circle. There's a band about that. And then you get your sheetrock saw right here. So if you don't know how to cut around circles, now you know how to cut around circles. Pretty simple. So that's what I do with tile or, or sheetrock or siding or anything like that. And anything else you want to talk about, Kenny? Uh No, I think we're good. Yeah. Was, uh, we're about to go eat lunch. True story. True story. Wait. There's something. Oh, that can wait till later. We are going to go eat lunch. I'm starving. I think my belly button's gnawing away at my spine right now. And clearly I'm sweating a lot. Show them how dry your shirt is. Way. Your hand's right in the way way dry now look at how wet my shirt is disgustingly wet <laughs> just nasty anyway love you guys so uh last week i showed you guys how to tape a bed we got the sheetrock up that's really amazing um and i showed you kind of the the slow let's patch something kind of way to tape a bed but now i'm going to show you how to tape a bed with a banjo and some people call it a banjo there's two different brands there's a banjo and a bazooka but basically what happens is you've got um and my friend nicole uh, maxwell from california was like haha you're gonna do this with a banjo you're fine but basically it's not an instrument so your roll of tape goes here and then it latches on if you can make your fingers work and then the tape comes through here and then you take mud that you mix up with water and fill this in okay i think you can see where this is going that um it the tape comes out and it coats Coast it with mud and then it saves you a process. So we're gonna try this real quick and see if it works. This is our first try. Since our last try. But basically, <clears throat> then you get this. And uh, let's try something low first. So it's got this handle and then you get your tape and pull on it and then just put it in place. Oops, try not to do what I just did there. And then you can do that a lot, right? So you can come back over here. Oh, I lost my tape. Darn it. <laughs> I know this would happen if I was shooting a video. It's not that hard to recover. Uh, and then, yeah, see it's gravity. Gravity doesn't want to be my friend right now. And that's got a thing at the end, you just cut it off, right? So pretty fantastical. And we'll do... And so um, after you do that, what do you do? Yeah, I'll show you. Okay, so then, normally I would take... So basically underneath the tape, it's filling up the with little mud, crack. Right, with mud. With so mud. normally I would, I would do as many joints as I could until I run out of mud. And then I'd come back and then you squeeze out the mud, right? So the bottom is always a mess, but... Just get this stuff out. So if you're doing a bigger thing than just a couple couple tape joints or whatever, then this really does help. I'm gonna scoop this over. Ugh. I look like I'm retarded right now. I don't mean retarded, I mean whatever a non- No, you, you do mean retarded. No, I, I mean like, what's a non-PC, non-offensive way to say that I'm not very smart? To, to speak about John, retarded. That's fair, I deserve that. Um, anyway, so that's that, and then I'll show you another one over here. So this one, this was, uh, we had a, a batch that's pretty wet, so it's probably gonna be pretty wet. And that's kind of what you do, right? So that's your first coat, and then that's the tape, the tape part of it. So here you can see that that tape sticking out. We want to put more mud behind it. And now it's not sticking out. So now you don't have some stupid looking bubble. And that's, that's that. And then uh, you come across with a bigger knife and then do a big wide uh, thing right here. So normally 
if you've got an eight foot ceiling, it's just one seam right here. But because this is more, this is like an eight foot seven or whatever, then we've got to have this piece in the middle. Uh, but that's how you use a banjo. So it's not an instrument, it is a tool. Love you guys. Uh, so we use the banjo to do tape embedding and we got all of this tape embedded one coat. We use the outside corners. I think I showed you how those work. You basically have this stuff and you put um, mud down and then put this in place and then press down on it. And then that's what we use around the windows and then around this whole, yeah, you can see it. And then around this, um, this whole inset thing over here. So remember, we, we framed all this up the other day. That's where the fans are going to be, and then that's where all the recess lights are going to be, and it looks really nice. So that is tremendous. Um, what would I like to talk to you guys about right now? What do you think, David? Baby elephants? Perfect. Okay, we're going to talk about baby elephants. So mm. that, is that what you were saying? No. I felt like it, that somebody was sending me a message telepathically talk about baby elephants, so I will. Uh, when baby elephants are in a circus, then uh, they want to break their will. So the elephants want to get away. Naturally, they want to be free. They're free creatures like all of us are. And so what they do is they drive a stake deep into the ground, wherever these baby elephants go, and they put a huge chain around their back leg. And these baby elephants want to be free. And so they pull and they tug and they pull and they tug and they pull and they tug and they really hurt themselves, right? They end up with a big scar around their back, back uh, leg, back foot. And eventually, they realize as much as I pull, and as much as I tug, and as much as I try to fight, I cannot escape this. I will never get away from this thing. And they stop trying because their will is broken. And they do this when they're small because if they try to do it when they're big, they can get away. And so they break their will when they're small. And then for the rest of their life, they have a tiny nylon yellow rope that goes around in a stake that's maybe on the ground a foot. And they feel any resistance and they just stop and they go, I've tried this before, it's hopeless. And they don't try anymore. <coughs> But the truth is that even if they have a big chain, as an adult elephant, if they, even if they have a chain and a big stake, they can lift that thing up and they can walk away for their freedom. And so I guess the point that I'm trying to make is, are we like that? When we're small, I feel like every one of us has been broken to some degree. We've been told you are not good enough, you cannot do this, you will not rise to this occasion, and just give up because it's hopeless. Don't even bother trying. You've been scarred by this, you've been hurt by this, and there's no point in even trying anymore. But the truth is, you're a big elephant now. So lift that foot up and walk away and be free from these bonds that are holding you for so long. So I'm pretty excited because I've got kind of a side hustle. I sold my homing pigeon on eBay for the 22nd time today, and I'm expecting it to come back on probably day after tomorrow, something like that. So I'm pretty excited about that. So uh, we had to take a break on this particular job because we had other jobs and there was city problems. Um, but I, it occurred to me that I haven't showed you guys how to do second and third coat on tape and bed yet. And so here's how it looks. So if we come close, and you see from the first coat, it looked pretty good, but it's got some rough stuff and it kind of shrinks back and you have like dimples and things like this. Where, see right here where the, the paper dimples because it sucks back in. And then on your nail holes, uh, you can see over there, it, it sucks back in here too, right? So what you got to do is get a wider knife, this 12 inch knife right here. That's a 12 inch knife rather than a six inch. And then you want to see that drag? That's bad. You don't want that drag. Then you want to float this out, right? So what the concept is that you're, you're building it out and then back in kind of, but it's very subtle. And so as you do that, you want it to be smooth. Finish looking. Like that kind of. And it's supposed to be real wide, right? A lot of people think that they do some small little tape on it, that's good, but it's not good. You want it to be real wide, taper it out and smooth. So see how that looks significantly better than say here or there. That's what you look for. You also want to hit all your nail holes again, which is pretty simple. And like that. This one, we have a double joint. So because this was over eight feet tall, we had to put a piece in the middle. And so that's slightly, I, I would finish that whole thing, but I'm just trying to show you guys fast. So you wanna kind of cover this middle part and then come out to the outside and then the other side. Like that. So you end up with a pretty wide tape joint on that, but then it looks, 
So, on your corners, the corner over here, give me a second. Let me get a different knife. Six inch knife, 12 inch knife. So, on the corners, you use a six inch knife. And um, you want to do one side of the corner. And see how it's got tape on it right now? We want to bed that tape, right? And then once that dries, then we'll come and do the other side of that. But it's okay if you have to do several passes to make it look good. So another thing is you hear people talk about sanding their, their tape and bedding. And a long time ago, which I never read, and I had to look at the pictures, but a long time ago, I was reading the back of the box of mud because I was bored. And it said not to sand at all because sand gets in your lungs and it's bad for you and stuff like that. And to actually use a wet sponge. But I say just make it right the first time and then you don't have to worry about sanding it at all. Not everybody has that, that luxury. All right, David, what else do you want to talk about? Um, it's time for my kids to start school. Yep. And neither of them want to find out everything they need in order to get started. So I'm at work and they're at home being lazy yeah. and not applying themselves. Yeah. So figure out what to talk about with that. Well, I think we should talk about time management and how important it is. Okay, like for example, it takes time for seeds to grow. Everybody thinks they're gonna wait till the last second and now I'm gonna do this. And you're like, it takes a while to get good at something. If you think you're gonna come in at the last second and be like, oh, here I am, I just showed up and look how awesome I am, you're wrong. You need to take the time and prepare every step of the way so that when something comes, this reminds me of a good story actually. So I have something up on my office wall and it's about a discus thrower. So in the 1800s, this guy wanted to throw the, the discus in the Olympics and he wanted to be able to not just throw it, but to beat the world record. So he got, went to the library and found the dimensions of this discus and he made one exactly to spec. And he's like, I got this. And he measured off in his field how far it was uh, to beat the world record. And he threw this discus all the time until finally he could beat that record every single time. And he was just like, I can beat the world record, no problem, I've got the discus, it's regulation, I'm ready to go. He goes and tries out for the Olympics, and they hand him the discus, and he's like, what's this little thing? And they're like, oh, that's a discus. And he goes, no, no, my discus is solid steel. And they're like, ours is wood and it's coated in a thin coat of steel. And he's like, ah. But the thing is, he had trained with something that was so heavy that by the time they gave him the real discus, he's like, I know I can, be, I know I can beat the world record with a heavy discus, watch this. And he just, <laughs> nobody touched his record for decades. Nobody could beat him because everybody practiced with the light thing and he had practiced with the heavy thing. And I think that sometimes in life, we're stuck with stuff that's like, man, this is really hard. This is really difficult. Why do I have to go through all this? But later on in life, Something comes along and you're like, this is nothing compared to what I've already dealt with. This pain is nothing like the pain I'm used to. And then you actually dominate. So I think it's very important to be as prepared as you possibly can every step of the way so that when hard, hard times come, you're ready. And it does take time for seeds to grow. All right, love you guys. What's up, John? Oh, hey, man. Uh, so, the laying the laminate floor this morning. It's pretty exciting. And I've got some news. You want to hear it? Yeah. All right. Uh, it's a little sad. I had to quit my job at the muffler factory. The it's muffler factory? It was exhausting. Uh, <laughs> I'm not even gonna turn the camera <laughs> on that one. <laughs> you can do that, it's okay. Um, so, we're laying on the floor, and uh, it's real easy to get off just a, just a smidge on this stuff, right? Like, stuff you think, oh, that doesn't matter, like a 16th, but then over time, it really makes a big difference. So. That got me thinking about how life works. And a lot of times we think what is a 16th of an inch here is off over time gets to be very off level. Several feet. Yeah, at, at which point you're like, why is that building sitting like that? And a foundation is very important. And um, you know, being straight level and all that, plumb is very important. But it's also important in our life. And sometimes maybe you notice that um, somebody's not doing things that are gonna help them in the long run. And so we have the opportunity to change the trajectory of their life through gentle, kind words, and usually by example, to just lead them just a little bit like adjust 
um, and make that, that fine-tuned correction that maybe they don't even notice, that changes the whole trajectory of their life and the whole destination of their life. And I think that's very important. I think it's important to encourage people and to love people and to, um, to make a difference in their life because one little mistake here will mess this whole floor up. And you know, if you're building concrete or something like that, you, oh, we're just a little bit off. And next thing you know, you're like, man, we're five inches out of level or something like that, which can be a real problem later and takes a lot of, well, it just causes a lot of frustration. And so if you have the opportunity to help somebody in their life, by all means, take that opportunity. So we're going to lay this floor today. It will not take very long. We got started about seven minutes ago, and I was like, we need to make a video because this day is going to be over before it even begins. We'll be done in 21 minutes. It really, yeah, I think 20 minutes flat, maybe seven extra seconds because we're talking, but uh, it's really quick on this stuff. Also, I'm not good with math. All right, so uh, see you guys soon. Hey, John. How are you doing? So I just want to take a moment to brag to you about my humility. I guess I won't do that. Uh, so David asked me a good question yesterday. We're, we got the floor done, that's amazing. Uh, now we're trimming this out, right? So he said, how do you know what angle to do around this stuff? And the answer is this. If this is a 90 degree angle, okay, which it is, so this is 90 degrees, then half of that is 45 degrees. And when you put the two pieces together, it's gonna, this is called a miter, this, this angle is called a miter, and I've got a miter saw, I'll show you in a second. So I put these two pieces up, I measure to the short side, and to the short side here, and then cut them off. But then we want to measure from the long side, the long side, up here, right? So that's 37 inches, and I'll show you how this works. This, this is a miter saw, and it's set to 45 degrees. And we want to cut this upside down. It'll be square up against it. And I'm cutting 37 inches to the long side of this cut. So there's the long side. There's the long side. So where you marked it is where you're gonna start. Right, so then I put my saw down, make sure I'm in the right place. Because we put two 45s together, and that makes a 90, and you can see it, it works. Obviously we're gonna talk that. So then in a corner, down here on the floor, we wanna do the same thing, right? We wanna come down here and measure this. So that'll be 101 and a quarter. And one more cut, and I'll just show you how it miters together. So that one's gonna be 51 and 7 eighths. So it goes to 90, you do a 45 degree angle. If it was a 45 degree angle, right? So a 90 looks like this. If it was a 45, then you cut it at 22 and a half because that's half of 45 or whatever your angle is. If it's a 60, you do it at 30 and then they match up. Because if you do a, a wrong angle, like let's say you did one in a 90, let's say you did a 10 and an 80, which would be a dumb way to cut it. Then your boards wouldn't sit like this. They'd sit like all wonky, right? It would be the wrong way. So you want to be right in the middle, but it's pretty simple. So that's how that works.